I've got a lot to show you, so I'll go straight into this. Can, can the light come down a bit in the front, or is that not possible? Anyhow, coming up from air is really talking about the sort of internal architectural culture of how we watch certain people, listen to certain people, and then this, usually the same old names keep coming around. Some of you sitting here hope to become the same old names of the next generation. It doesn't always happen. And so, you know, there are a lot of people that I, I know and admire and so on. They're not, in, they're not in it. I'm starting with what I call simple history or pesky talent. Now, Christopher Wren obviously was a great operator, but, you know, Hawksmoor, that was the interesting guy. Or me and a whole lot of generations either side of me brought up on the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus is, 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 is the easy brand of modernism. But what about funny guys like Hugo Herring? A bit kind of hanging out, a bit more original. Or even, you know, even when you go to Paris and you look at the, the Corbusier buildings, I'm sort of fascinated by funny guys like Mallet Stevens. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't as talented. But there are lots of things he did that were, in some ways, you know, on, off the edge. And certainly when we come to nearly contemporary people, you know, there are people with immense power, mon power influence, and architectural chit chat. But there's a real talent, sadly, I'm, I have to say, in my dead section. So this is the dead section. They're extinct, but I think still sending out waves. Not to my taste, but one has to admit that Aldo Rossi is there in the background to, to many things that rather, some rather good architects do. I think, to me, Rossi is, is a, not a Calvinist, but there's a sort of parallel of that kind of architecture to Calvinism, to very grim thinking. Um, Whereas somebody like Oitha, I once took a bunch of students, and Oitha talked, and he's a very old man by that time, talked for four hours, wouldn't let us out of the room, with immense enthusiasm. But the enthusiasm followed up by really rather more than cute detailing, I mean extraordinary detailing of both of those buildings. But what about strange people around the corner? The 90-year-old Fisak was still alive when I was taken to see him but a sad person who'd been pushed out by the religious, uh, whatever you'd like to call them in, in, in Madrid. He'd been, he'd been deliberately sidetracked and sat in a little house in a far-flung corner. And of course, his best building pulled down. And Fisak was in, even into quilted concrete, which now has come back as a sort of fashionable conversation. Old Fisak was there uh, way, way back. There are other people who happen to be sort of either in the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps in the right place at the wrong time. And I still come back to Pancho Geddes, who at an age older than I am now, spent two hours taking people around, finally recognized in Lisbon, around the, the, the museum there, where he had his kind of 900 artifacts up. And he did really weird shit out in, in what was then called Mozambique. Uh, and always doing weird shit drawings, because I mean that drawing on the right is, is a cross-section of a building. But the buildings don't disappoint either, and the plan of the hotel bottom left is still my favorite plan of a hotel and would have been fantastic. But there are other people, sadly, much younger, who, you know, were sort of on the edge. I mean, Catherine, I think, was always treated with, with, with distance when she lived in Tokyo. And who else would do a soft and hairy house. Uh, returning to the UK, she did this, I think she won the competition for a country house, a brilliant project, which uh, Zaha was actually jealous of, which I suppose is some kind of accolade. Ah! What's that? <laughs> it is, of course, our late lamented friend, Will Alsop, who, top right, was still doing very, very original stuff right to the bitter end. I think the top right was only a year or so before he died, if I'm right. And, of course, the much lamented Enrique, who I taught alongside for some years and saw in action. What is interesting about some of his buildings, they look, well, one building did collapse, but not his fault, but they look as if they're about to collapse, and they lean, and then you look at the detail, and actually it's incredibly clever stuff, and 
clever engineering. And he once at the Berkeley gave a two and a half hour lecture on this building, starting off with the details and only revealing the final building at the end of the lecture. An extraordinary talent, which those of you who go to Edinburgh to see the Parliament will see, of course, helped out by, by his, his widow, Benedetta. The impact of drawing, well, there's a lot that I and my friends talk about drawing. Some people would, and my wife, Yael, would sometimes argue with me that, 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 you know, if you can draw beautifully, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can design. But what is intriguing about Leb is that before he did all these drawings, he was a job architect on a very large building in New York and was trained as an engineer. And what's intriguing about his drawings is that they, always, they didn't show perfect objects. There was always patina. There was always a hint, the thread of, of, of the thing collapsing or exploding. And he reputedly drove into Sarajevo during the middle of the, the war in an armored car and taught for two weeks and then was driven out in an armored car. He, he was looking for trouble. And then, was, then the, towards the end of his life, he started to actually make spatial conditions. This is a very bad photograph of, of an exhibition in Paris and Cartier Center. And of course, you know, strands going across space are very fashionable right now. A funny old story. I, I just want to introduce something. You know, what is, what is, the, what is the hope of the architect? What is the predicament of the original architect? After all, hanging out with, with Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, he did effectively sort of almost Corbusian villas with a few extras. So he's a proper, down-the-line, modernist architect. Ha! What's that? Bloody hell! It's a library. So actually, if you analyze the building, it is a large book stack on top of some public rooms. So it's actually pretty normal. But he started going over the top. He started doing more and more and more drawings and built himself a weird shit house. And then it got even stranger and stranger. What's going to happen to this guy? He retreats to his house, gets depressed, kills himself. I'm not suggesting this is a, a corollary of doing original work, but it, it does make you think. There's another category of people there, which is what I call simmering. They are around. They are not dead. They are around us. Uh, my friend Svi Hecker, when, when the Scuds were landing in, in Tel Aviv some years ago, the police phoned him up and said, something's happened to your building. In fact, nothing had happened to the building. It was, and I always say, when, when I first saw this years ago, I said, it's NATO built. It's as near as, it's as near, particularly on this picture. It's as near as NATO built as anything you'll ever find. And then he, he won some competitions, moved to Berlin, it's the Berlin School, and he's actually built round the corner, except I've never seemed to find it on Schiphol. He uh, is still, he's just finished the, um, the security village at Schiphol Airport, in fact. A guy that I have enormous time for, never seems to get beyond local recognition, is Chapella. And these buildings, I think, have won competitions but not necessarily been built. Uh, there's a whole story about his winning of the, of the uh, Anger van der Kunst building, which is, I will not go further into, but it caused a stink because he won it and everybody wanted somebody else to win it. And he should have won it, and this is the scheme. But watch Chapella. Watch him. He's, and watch funny characters who are in slightly funny places like you know, Albuquerque, which is not, frankly, the centre of the world. But, and then builds in Winnipeg, which also is, quite frankly, not the centre of the world. I think we, we become too metropolitan where you expect there to be interesting architecture. It's not... Ha! What's that? <laughs> Bloody hell. Well, I know about this guy, because I gave him first prize in the Shinkenchuku donkeys years ago. And he did, this was his project for the Shinkenchiku competition, which was called uh, Confusion. Uh, having won the, the money, he then went and worked for Gun Gunter Domenic, which caused more confusion, I think, uh, usefully. And there he is. And I have a terrible 
tale to tell. I was in a bar in Tokyo with Tom Hannigan and Catherine Finley, and uh, had met him a few times before. And I said uh, he just he built this this building in Rapongi or somewhere. And I said, "How are things going?" He said, uh, "Wife dead, building demolished," which is a bit of conversation stopper. I mean, uh, <laughs> He has since remarried and done more buildings, but he's an extra odd, odd character who, um, you know, it's, it's even for somebody who likes, as I keep saying, weird shit, it's, it's a difficult to grasp vocabulary. Then there are people who are very much in full fight. No problem with those. Um, in, in, in the Architectural Association, which I think the the ladies coming this afternoon, um, they're all wetting their knickers over Pier Vittorio Orelli. You know, he's got acolytes, he's got people. And for me, with a slightly long memory, I think, but we did all that. We did all that. It's back to Matthias Ongers. You know, and that, that, it sort of irritates if you see something that wasn't really your bag come around again. What do you do with that intellectually? Ah! This is one, actually, that Yell discovered long before I did. And it's interesting that he himself claims to be, well, he's an ex-student of Greg Lynn. He claims to be part of that, the gang around Greg Lynn. But when you look at it, he's wanting to be a neoclassicist. I think there's very little doubt that he's wanting, and he did work for Bob Stern, which, of course, <laughs> adds, to the, adds to the question. But he is nonetheless erudite, and intriguing. You can't, some of these people, you can't ignore them. You don't even want them to go away. You want them to, in a way, confuse the issue. And I think the most beautiful thing I've seen at a, at a Biennale, um, I don't know with the guys in the room, I see his, his somewhere, gave a beautiful lecture last week at the party. John Wardle, his, his object in the, in the Arsenale, the last Biennale of Venice, was fantastic and intriguing and elegant and tricky and cultural and you know we can do it better in Australia than you can do it in bloody Europe that's for sure and his buildings continue to shock by their elegance and their aesthetic or you get nutters like Fujimori who actually was is and was and is an academic actually professor of history at Tokyo University and it was only that Ito didn't want to do a certain job and he was a neighbor and he gave it to Fujimori and suddenly Fujimori after being considered as a historian and if uh, university historians here should think twice perhaps because he starts doing these things in the end and it, in conversation with him through a translator he does know about English arts and crafts movement. If you look at some of his stuff, you know that he knows about the English arts and crafts movement, although I wouldn't make more British claim upon him. But it's there. And God, we've got quilting again. He, I think, couldn't possibly have known, couldn't possibly have known Fizak. But it's a bit interesting <laughs> that these guys somehow go for quilting. I'll just leave that as an uncomfortable thought. And then there's a whole stream of people in Madrid that, that intrigue me. It's us, and of course, we, we, we meet often every week at the Bartlett, and she does things with bicycle wheels. She's, she's wonderful, over-the-top person, and plants these, these extraordinary ob objects. Um, in, now, there is a man, an almost secret man, called Pirea, who has taught in Madrid for many years. And all the Madrid people I'm showing now, different though they are, all studied with that guy. I'm always intrigued by things like this. Something going on, even though... Uh, and and Hack and, and Chinchilla, it's sort of unspoken, but now it's spoken. They're very much in a sort of rivalry between the two. They all came out of Perea's studio. As did this a, a, a guy that... Uh, we judged in Cyprus two or three years ago, uh, and, and Elis Engelis, and I really wanted this guy to win, but the locals couldn't, couldn't 
I mean, this project would have been extraordinary, but there is a cultural issue with sort of islands in love with their past uh, and rather second-rate a second rate level of architecture. I'm being bitchy now, but it would have been unbelievable. Uh, and he's, an, he's going to win one of them any minute, I think. Or Gil Ptolemy, who was actually a Bartlett student after studying with Perea. And other, all of these guys came out of a, a single studio. And it's sort of beyond, it's beyond a joke. Or oldies. We once had the Bartlett. Gaetano Pesky talking about a rubber house. And a moderately sophisticated London audience is funny about rubber houses. Uh, you don't quite know how things are going to go at the end of it. And he got away with it. The kids loved it. But he didn't know whether just a rubber houses would be a bit too much for them. And, ah! Hold on, MVRDV. Uh -huh. What's going on? I don't, I mean, it's a very obscure project. And he's kind of, can be sort of cute. I once had suffer in a, an apartment in, done by one of his, his lovers who, who, in New York, and it was full of Gaetano Pesce sort of basins and floors and windowsills. It, it's, 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 it's quite extraordinary. Sort of slightly hard to take somehow. But he's still an interesting architect. He's usually dismissed as a sort of chair maker or object maker. Cute. Yes, we are f familiar with cute drapes, particularly if you're in architecture. And some interesting architects don't just do the drapery. I think that much as the fact that Ma Yan Song can be kind of irritating, I think he can also prove that he, he is very dexterous. It's not just a cloak person. He's not just a sort of press the button parametric person. And I find projects like this, where it starts having individual substance, really quite interesting. Ha! Isn't it funny? You do this thing, it's wonderful, and then you, you want to make a, a poke it. It's very odd, that. I mean, it's a, maybe it's some instinctive, uh, well, may have overtones that are more basic, but uh, it does intrigue me. But some people, it irritates me again, rather like uh, uh, Chapella. Look, they are sort of known in certain ways, but they are, you know, somebody like Maya is, I think, very original, very talented, and very intriguing. He, he sets up a solid which isn't doing the things that solids usually do. And yet it has an entrails in the solid, less so in, in the Seville building, but certainly in his concrete buildings. And I don't know why he isn't up there somehow. And even the bloody Swiss, who are not my favorite thing, they, there's the odd talented one who starts letting it hang out. So I don't know Mr. Zuber, but I'm, I'm, I congratulate him. Uh, he says pompously, upon letting it hang out. And you can see he wants things to hang out, but he's still a bit Swiss, so he can't quite <laughs> manage that, you know? Um, I think one of the most impressive buildings I've ever been in, um, and I'm not going to show Clorindo Testa's bank again, because I use it in every second lecture, and I think it's part of the audience probably be bored with me showing it, but how about Alberto Calac? and his Mexico City Library. It's an extraordinary, it is a rack, or a myriad of racks. And that's it. It's a rack that you wrap. But he's not just a one-shot one pony. He's actually done a very large number of, of how, mostly houses, uh, both in, in Mexico and a bit in California. And there's another kid came to the Bartlett once and gave a very witty, in English, very witty lecture. Very caustic and very witty. And yet, never talked about in Europe. Never talked about in Europe. Or some people I don't know, but intriguing in another direction, sort of brooding. There's a sort of Nordic brooding scene, which can get a bit sort of pleased with itself. But I think certainly worth taking on board as 
needing to come up for air. Maybe they need a bit of air as well. And then you get people who are associated with one kind of architecture. You discover that actually Mr. Radic is doing constructivism somewhere, somewhere, somewhere out there in, in Chile, though his brooding work uh, I find more intriguing. I don't think his, his London pavilion was him at his best. I think he's better than that. And certainly those, those spooky things in the trees start to... Uh, the, the least intrigue one. And spooky things of a different kind coming of all places from Canada. The pat cows are again known in certain circles, but, but much, much less than their clear talent, both not only in, in, in producing formal objects, but some of their schools are extremely unusually planned and intelligently planned. Um, and their pieces, the pieces of uh, the bottom left is actually an organizational model for a building. The bottom right, obviously, is an entrance. And the, 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 the school, I couldn't find an interior that would communicate, but that has an extraordinary kind of spinal system running inside it, the, the school. And there are people who we know, and because of their success at a certain level of, of design, we associate that they must be... Do, that's what they do. And Ron, for many years, has said, you know, it's his, his chairs that have subsidized the architectural practice. But in fact, the architectural practice not only exists um, via things like the Holon Museum, which you could say in, in conceptual terms is something of a toy added to a box. But I think now he's building high rises. Um, they're, no long, they're by no means toys applied to a box. He's in there for the whole hog. And it's, it's pretty memorable. It's not doing all the most fashionable things, it's doing something else. And then you get odd characters. I don't know this character, uh, and I think it's a man rather than a lady, but he, you can do some original things in very modest circumstances. You don't need it to be in a metropolitan location. You don't need it to be expensive. And then there are the kids coming up, uh, or rather trickling down. Into the, the, the idea of, of building and trickling down into the city I've always found intriguing. Uh, again, then, another character who's doing these kind of spooky, spooky, kiln-like buildings, and people doing rather, in, in Shanghai, doing rather European facades. I found what's intriguing about this, not only I love kiosks, I, I like his kiosk, uh, but he, the, if you look at that facade, it could be Netherlands or Belgium, you know, or somewhere in Ireland. It's, it, it, it's, it's intriguing that that, that is uh, developing in, in China. And in, in, in Tokyo... There are kids, these are a couple who used to work for Sana, but obviously breaking free of Sana, uh, but haven't yet done anything very big. And I, these, I think these are Chinese guys working out of LA. Again, starting to break free. And these are favorites of mine. Uh, I think they've won awards here in the past. They might even be up for something this, this week, I don't know. And they do what they, they call plug-in houses, uh, they do <laughs> strange. And if you think of that, if you think of the Andre Huck house and this, there's something going on in a loop between maybe Madrid and Beijing. And they do sillies. They do almost archigram tradition sillies. Uh, you don't really need there to be four cyclists to move a tent, but... Why not? <laughs> Maybe three of them haven't got much else to do anyhow. <laughs> and then back to spookies, back to kiln-like spookies. There's something going on in the back of certain architect's mind that is, is it sinister? Is it religious? Is it a kind of innate wish to break out of the box and break out of the skirt? and have strange, 
courtyards, the secret places, strange things over the head by otherwise perfectly respectable architects. A couple who were in a competition here uh, a couple of years ago didn't win. Now they have broken through with their uh, department store thing in Toronto. They actually are Japanese or Japanese-Canadian couple uh, working out of the unlikely hotbed of Co Toronto. And there is, meanwhile, a, a whole church of the parametric, and, and really the queen of the church, apart from having dated Brad Pitt, which is, I suppose, considered a sort of gong of some sort, um, is, is, is really the queen of, of the movement and considered to be the cleverest person in the business. And so if one goes to places like Frack and sees what is going on of late, it has become, some of it very original, some of it very Baroque, and certainly not just drapes. This is my point. That has to be watched, because the sooner that that gets into the mainstream, the better. And some of Nigel's extraordinary things in previous years, you imagine it done by the guy on top right, whose name I've forgotten. So we look to the east, and we wonder. I'm definitely looking at the east. I can plot in, in the wafts of recent years, the number, not just the number of young people from China, to some extent Japan and, and district, <laughs> but the, the degree to which they're pushing the edge and I think in five years' time, all these sort of German and Anglo-Saxon and Australian judges will have to retire. It, it ought to be a different scene, but that may be an uncomfortable thought. And I've actually left myself ten minutes for questions, Jeremy. Well, um, Peter, that's excellent. Thank you very much. I think what you've done is to give us an insight into various trends in architecture across the world that don't conform, and by not conforming, they actually open new territories. I'm thinking of the spooky. I mean, that's a mm -hmm. word I haven't heard too often in architectural oh, hear it from me often. Yeah, I might hear it from <laughs> you, but, but um, I'm not sure it's one I would use, although I'd like to be able to. Um, but I think it, it, it's taking these, if I may say, slightly sly or sideways looks into what people do and say, hey, that isn't just a big building in Tel Aviv, like mm -hmm. Ron Arrow's building. It, it is actually doing something that's part of a way of thinking about architecture, um, which is testing the boundaries or living perhaps just within or just on the other side of, of where the boundaries of what we think architectural taste is. Yeah, and I think it's also biographical in the sense that there's certain people like Svi Hecker uh, was when I first met him when I was first with Yale, and, and he was treat, almost shunned by the local Tel Avivian mm. architects, befriended by artists. Mm until he won a couple of competitions in quick succession. Then, of course, the museum gives him a show and all the architects come back to his uh, yeah. you know, New Year party, which <laughs> is, makes you sick, really, but we, we, it's every, um, and, and, and there are certain people who sort of appear to go to sleep, and then, mm. God, they're still at it. And so poor Pancho Geddes, he was booted out of, he, he ran the Vitvotas Round School, yeah. and then in old age came back to Portugal, and he's not what the Portuguese do. And he mm. moved to a little house and he started doing funny things at the entrance. And then, you know, just before he died, had this enormous show and everybody, you know, so these guys, the yeah. pattern is that they're shunned and then the people around the world take interest in them and suddenly they have their... Yeah. Death well, Row show. Punch, of course, is part of Team 10, wasn't he? He was associated well, with... A fringe him. member of Team 10 and... and uh, Alison Smithson once said, oh, he's too lazy, which I could never understand. <laughs> the law, he did 400 buildings yeah. and innumerable pieces of sculpture and so on. And ran, ran a large school of architecture. Yeah. Many years, so, you know, by definition, um, not the, lazy. The, the, I'm not sure whether one can say there's a definite pattern, mm. but it is interesting to take certain people's psychology and certain of them, they just hang on in there mm. until somehow it, it gels. Yes. Um, and they tend to be people who are at the edge of the local mm. OK scene. So mm. they might 
be seen at a cocktail party, but probably not. Yeah. And they're sitting somewhere in an old house at the edge. Yeah. And then, with luck, some just then die. Yeah. But with luck, they, they re-emerge. Yeah. No, but I think it's, it, it's, it's very interesting. If you take Portugal, um, where we're going to be next year, for those of you who don't know, we're going to be in Lisbon next year. Um, and, of course, you've got Angola on one side of southern Africa and Mozambique on the other. And someone who knew about the Portuguese empire said it was all the naughty people who went to Mozambique. It was that bit further and they had that bit more freedom. Whereas Angola, which was a richer country and, you know, that you had to be proper and, you know, wear your starch collar sort of thing. Ah, but I have a second take on that because the really interesting city in, in, in Portugal is the Porto. Yeah. which does everything wrong and everything naughtily. And it has a, a, a main street that goes down the hill in the middle of the town, stops. It has a crossing of the river which has a bridge on top of another bridge, bridge. as if they said, not yeah. quite sure which one is going to work. <laughs> and, and, and hilarious, hilarious architecture, which is everything sort of Belgian Art Deco through to sort of, yeah. you know, Wiltshire. <laughs> <laughs> All cheap by jars. So I, I think there has to be something built into WAF which says, you know, if you really want to see... Yeah. Good shit. And, and, and uh, mm. um, in fact, Rem's building in, in Porto, Porto is, is extraordinary, perverse and extraordinary. Yeah, and it's, it's one of the best of his I've seen, certainly, mm. and, and experienced. But I, I think, coming, coming back to someone else who I think is really interesting is uh, Fujimori. Mm. And, you know, he obviously doesn't speak English. But well, his wife teaches English. Okay, so that is really convenient. Yeah. But... but you know, he's absorbed the English arts and crafts movement of all bizarre movements mm. to absorb. And then no, he admits he did, yeah. I think, two tours of English arts and crafts. Yeah. And it show, you can see, see even yeah, the sort yeah. of thatch detail. You know. And there was one building he had that seemed to be floating. I don't quite know how. Well, that... yes, there's a story. Yeah, we'll tell the story that he was giving us lunch up there. And I was too scared on the top of the ladder that I only stuck my head in the hole. <laughs> and dis quickly descended. <laughs> Um, yeah. But he's done a number of these uh, houses in his original village. There's a little mm. museum and one of his houses on sticks. Mm. Otherwise, it's just a perfectly normal village in a valley somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and his own house, I have to report that the twigs haven't really grown, so that it, you have to see early photographs of it, which suggests that trees are growing out of the mm. roof. Because mm. when mm. we saw it, they were sort of wilting they're probably not even there now yeah. but having report i mean that's a typical sort of downer yeah. report i think he's 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 extraordinary and uh extraordinarily sophisticated i mean it's yeah. it's very knowing stuff well you're absolutely right the way the thatch on that house yeah, goes, he's, he's know, very knowing it could have been done by someone in wilcher yeah you know well, they well he's fat, fat. seen that yeah. stuff yeah yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and i think uh, catherine finley again when you mm. know late in life she did the, the this uh, swimming pool with mm. thatch and I remember her giving a lecture extremely uh, accurate mm. discussion of the thatch and how it was a sort of mm. 21st century mm. thatch mm. there are these people who have who are quite comfortable to refer back into history yeah. or to use the latest technology or to combine it and I think one of the one of my irritations with, with very much architecture is that it sticks within a single sort of done. Mm. Buddy O'Reilly calls his office dogma. Now, yeah. to me, you know, <laughs> child of the Second World War, all the rest of it, yeah. that is, is yeah. very unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. But, f for the, you know, there is this thing that an architect says, we don't do that, we yeah. don't do that, we don't understand this, so we will do this. Mm. But and I keep looking at Nigel, who <laughs> was the last person who would sit within yeah. that. Uh, but there's, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're right in implying that there's a sort of um, disciplinary centre of gravity in architecture, in architecture. Yeah, I have a slide which I didn't use yeah. here, which I have eight gentlemen, all gentlemen, all either German or English, mm. all looking grim-faced. <laughs> uh, and my caption is, architecture is no laughing matter. 
but I have used it rather often. So yeah, I yeah. Think no, I think it, it's a good one because, of course, the, the, the person who they looked to, who was never so, well, he was dogmatic in some ways, but not in others, was Mies, you know, because Mies was the great dictator of certain sorts mm -hmm. of form. But he wouldn't have imposed, you know, he liked other sorts of architecture. He yeah. worked with Hugo Herring, for example. I didn't know that. Yeah, they yeah. shared an office. And, and well, um, that's uh, even uh, and Mies, more Mies would say, Hugo, make it bigger, make it bigger, because Herring was trying to get the minimal. Well, space. there's an old quote of Peter Smithson, who was my tutor in fifth year. There was a famous quote of Smithson, which is, Mies is great, but Corp communicates, <laughs> which is totally meaningless. Yes. <laughs> but it lies with me for sort of 50 yeah. years. And what does he mean? Mies is great, but Corb communicates. <laughs> and yeah. it's still a... It's one of those yeah. stupid yeah, yeah, yeah. one-liners, and you think there's something in that. What do we mean? Mm. What do we mean? What do we mean? Mm. Well, Peter, thank you very much for showing My us pleasure. how we can break out of these uh, tram lines and do things that are more imaginative. I mean, I'm just come thinking about Paolo Aurelli, who reminds me of Hilbersheimer with a bit of colour. Well, occasionally colour. Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot of colour. Not a lot. <laughs> but, you know, Hilbersheimer had none. You know, yeah. uh, total anathema. But anyway. Uh, so he's gone soft. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for, you. for this uh, you know, inspiring talk about certain you know, byways and uh, you know, side lanes of contemporary architecture. But nonetheless, very good ones. Thank, thank you. you.